The following is a Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production. Well, welcome back. We are into uh, section three and I'm going to turn it right over to Nick. Uh, what are the next two or three logical fallacies that we'll be talking about next? Well, the next uh, two are special pleading and the gambler's fallacy. If we have some extra time, we can go into black or white. That's a Masonic favorite. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and start with special pleading. Okay. All right, special pleading is, uh, this is an interesting thing. It's almost going off the topic is the best way to describe it. You will, you'll hear people almost like a change of subject. It's moving the goalposts or making up exceptions once you're found that your claim is shown to be false. If there's no truth within your claim, then all of a sudden they change it in order to turn into something else. Um, you see a lot of this uh, in religious discussions, and, and I don't want to get too heavy into religion, but one of the concepts that I've, I've had people tell me before is, oh, you just don't have enough faith. If you had enough faith, you'd understand it, or you would, you would see what this means. Um, so here's a, an example of a special pleading argument. Edward Johns claimed to be psychic, but when his abilities were tested under proper scientific conditions, they magically disappeared. Edward explained saying that one had to have faith in his abilities for them to work. You kind of see where I'm going here? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I, you know, let's, let's bring a little bit of masonry into this. Um, <clears throat> the, the, uh, the, the conspiracy theorists continually say when they bring up something about masonry, they, they automatically, when you question them, they say, well, you're not high enough up. You're not high enough. <laughs> you know, you, you're, only a, you're only a 43rd degree mason. You know, you have to be a 99 <laughs> to, to, to be in on this particular information. And of course, my response back is, is always, well, what, uh, what level are you <laughs> to know this stuff? <laughs> The 99th degree, that's a good one. We, we don't do that at our lodge yet, but one day maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you hear this kind of stuff uh, in, in arguments all the time. Somebody will basically try to change what the criteria is uh, once, their once their argument's found to not be correct. Like the person would say, uh, well, you can't know everything you need to know about masonry. You're not high enough. So uh, at, at that point, they're altering the concept of the third degree being the highest uh, degree in all masonry. Well, how do you go about spotting this? If you're really not looking for it, what is a red flag that you ought to look for when you're, when you're hearing a special pleading coming your way? And it's like, where did that come from? One would assume that when you're having a discussion or, or a, an argument that's trying to come to the truth, you're going to know more about the subject you're talking about than not necessarily than the other person will, but you know enough about the subject to know when somebody tells you something about it, like, well, my friend's a, a 98th degree Mason, you just immediately know that that's not right. Um, there's a book that was written by a gentleman, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to point fingers at this guy, but I do remember reading this part of the book where it said he was studying to get his 32nd degree. Now, anybody who's in Scottish Rite knows that the 32nd degree isn't technically something you have to study for in most jurisdictions. I know here in Alaska, if you join the Scottish Rite, you get your 32nd degree after the initiation over the weekend or the, the festival that they do. So when I read that in the book, I immediately went, okay, this guy's trying to tell, he's trying to portray himself as someone that he's not. And then if you were to question him about it, say, hey, I don't understand what this means. Uh, how are you studying for your 32nd degree? The guy could easily look at you and say, oh, it's a different branch of masonry that you're probably not familiar with yet. Oh. Now you're making a special pleading, okay. something yeah. that doesn't exist. Totally get it. All right. Th thank you. Yeah, not a problem. Um, then we'll head on to the gambler's fallacy. This one's a lot of fun uh, because I, what I do is I tend to find myself doing this in my head when things like when things like this happen. Uh, the gambler's fallacy, basically, it believes that runs occur to statistically independent phenomena such as a roulette wheel spin. So 
primary example. Uh, red had come up six times in a row on the roulette wheel, so Greg knew that it was a close to certain that black would be the next up. Suffering an economic form of natural selection with this thinking, he soon lost all of his savings. Uh, a high school math teacher told me one time, he said, if you flip a coin and it comes up heads 10 times in a row, what's the probability it'll come up heads on the 11th flip? Is that a question? <laughs> That's a question, yeah. Do you know what the, the probability is? Well, I, I'd say 50-50. It's still 50-50. No matter how many times you got heads before that, your chances are still 50-50 when it comes to it. This People do this. This is why casinos make so much money. It's a prime example. I'm going to put all my money on red, and it came up uh, black six times in a row, or vice versa, and then I, I go ahead and flip my money to the other color, spin again, and now it comes up the other color. It It's all based on what is happening at the time, not statistically what has happened in the past. So when I say I find myself doing this, I will, I'll try something a bunch of times, and then I'll say, you know, it's been enough time between something I was working on. I'll go back and try it again. And then when I try it again, same thing happens. I still can't figure it out. I have to, I have to tell myself that I'm, I'm facing the gambler's fallacy here. I'm expecting something different to happen based on previous statistics, and it doesn't work like that. I have to change my game plan at, at going toward what I'm trying to accomplish. So, so a gambler's fallacy is where you're looking at the trends rather than the probabilities that the trend of the uh, history of something occurring again and again and again, you're not looking at the probability, you're looking at the trends and how that past history just unwound and you're making a decision based on what you've seen occur and the trend as opposed to the actual statistical probability itself. Yes, um, the biggest thing about this that people will see is if you're watching the parties, the, the Republicans and Democrats vote a specific way, you may, your representative may vote yes on all of the partisan stuff and then vote no on nonpartisan stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's going to vote no on something that's nonpartisan or yes on something that isn't. He may vote the opposite direction, vote based on his conscience, based on what he thinks is the right idea, based on uh, any number of things. But we see this a lot in elections. So a, a gambler's fallacy, and when placed within an argumentative context, I hope I said that right, is where somebody is presenting information because they're and they're presenting it as a trend as opposed to a statistical probability. And they're get, trying to get you to buy in to the trend rather than the statistics. Correct. And again, it doesn't mean the trend is incorrect. It just means that you can't assume that the, the next outcome is going to be based on the statistics. So you're buying into the conclusion based on a gambler's fallacy. Absolutely. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Um, do we have enough time for a third one? Yes, we do. All right. And this is one of our Masonic favorites. Are you ready for this? Yes. There it is. Ah, uh, love Black it. Right. <laughs> the, the checkered pavement. The black or white argument is probably one of the, the, the bigger ones that we see. I'll give you a, an example of it. Uh, two alternative states are presented as the only possibilities when in fact there are more possibilities that exist. The, the concept is it's not black or white, it's also gray. When we say the black or white checkered, checkered pavement, a lot of the concept comes from the good or evil or right or wrong. Black or white is basically a way of saying it's it's this way or it's that way. You can't possibly have anything in between. Uh, here's an example. Uh, while rallying support for his plan to fundamentally undermine citizens' rights, the Supreme Leader told the people they were either on his side or on the side of the enemy. Communist manifesto. <laughs> that kind of thing right there. Okay, so what comes to mind immediately is that I've heard this fallacy framed differently rather than black or white, I've heard either or, uh, all or nothing. It's always polar opposites. And there was something recently on the internet uh, shared where somebody was calling it, I think the fork fallacy, where they were using a fork fallacy to 
dismiss arguments in general and, and fa uh, logical fallacies in general. But they were actually, what I'm hearing you say is they were using a black and white fallacy to prove that logical fallacies were, were uh, in, our, on, in our heads, uh, imagination. Yes. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the thing about the fork fallacy, but it, it makes sense. If you fork to the left or fork to the right, then you're going to have opposites on either side. Um, this particular type of thing has been, in my opinion, has been detrimental, and it really tarnishes the way a person interacts with another person. And I, I saw a lot of this during our last election. And again, I'm not picking sides here because I'm not, I don't, I'm not playing the politics thing. But if you voted for Trump you had to hate Hillary. If you voted for Hillary, you had to hate Trump. That's the things that just kind of go along with it. And and I don't agree with that entirely. I think people have the right to their opinion. It doesn't necessarily mean if you vote for one, you hate the other, but that comes on that comes off quite a bit when you try to when you try to have a discussion about something that's political and you and you bring up a topic uh, that is covered so heavily in the news, uh, like a current event, and you say, well, I think this. And another person goes, oh, that's just the other party's rhetoric, and, and you just don't understand. They immediately throw you into that black or white category. So because you believe one way, you have to be black. Because you believe the other way, you have to be white. And it's, it, it's again, it's a form of pigeonholing a person into that mindset or that stereotype that because you think this on one topic, you must fall into the category with all the rest. So what to be looking out for when people are proposing some sort of argument with a conclusion is when, looking for a po polarity in a sense, any kind of, it's an either or kind of situation one way or another, but there's no third or fourth possibility that is being considered in the argument. That's generally what it is. Um, and the thing to look out for is when you say, I like apples, and the other person says, well, you must hate oranges then, because apple people hate oranges. Well, that's not necessarily <laughs> true. I like apples, and I like oranges. And But because you're bringing up a topic that does seem to have another uh, side of it, uh, I'm going to bring up one that's controversial. Say you're pro-choice or or uh, pro-abortion. Just because you're pro-abortion doesn't mean you don't have some pro-choice ideas. It Just because you're, uh, maybe I have the terms wrong here, uh, just because you believe it's okay for a woman's right to choose doesn't mean you necessarily are okay with everything that, that goes along with the abortion issue. You can't make that that particular topic black or white. It can't be all or nothing. I um. <sighs> It, my, my brain tends to work out of a box and I'm, I'm saying to myself, well, what if they presented an argument where there are only three possibilities? Uh, would that also kind of fit into the black and white because they're limiting you to three and, and there actually could be a lot more? Yeah, I think so. I, I think that kind of fits into a black or white um, because yeah, if, if there's more options available than just the ones they give you, then yes, that would be considered a black or white argument, um, even though it may have three or four technical possibilities where there are, there may, they may present you with three or four possibilities, but there's probably eight different ways to do it. That's kind of the same thing. Yeah. So, th so effectively the, the person putting the argument forth is trying to control and, and restrict the way that you can work your way through whatever they're presenting. So by controlling the playing field, so to speak, they're limiting your ability to argue and, and uh, object, so to speak. Absolutely. That is 100% correct. By limiting your scope on or coming up with an alternative idea, you are making people choose sides. And that doesn't get to the truth. Just because wow. you have more people on your side doesn't mean you're right. Just because Which... you're following an elite <laughs> lemming might mean you're walking off a cliff. Thank you. Uh, Nick, uh, why don't we go ahead and close this segment down and we'll start another one real soon. You've been watching a Brother Asks and Building Better Builders video education series production.